This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. She's done. I'm calling time. I try not to declare careers over too early. Katie's still making music. She's got a new song right now. Maybe it'll take off. Who knows? But sometimes you just have to make the call. And I say, when you've basically set up permanent residence in Vegas and you're performing your old hits next to a singing shit in a giant toilet, you're you, it, you're done. It's done. Finito. I could be wrong. That new song could start climbing up from the bottom of the charts next week, and boy, won't I look stupid. Well, you know what? If that does happen, I can at least console myself for my wrong prediction by knowing that I was not alone. From the moment I started this series about career-killing albums, Katy Perry's fourth LP, Witness, was one of my top requested episodes. That was just four months after the record came out, and yet everyone had just instantly known that Katy Perry was no longer a concern to popular music. At the dawn of the 2010s, Katy Perry had basically kicked off the decade with an astonishing five number one singles off one album, plus three more in the years after. She was a winner among winners. And yet everything about Witness radiated failure, like nothing else I've ever seen in my time as a professional music critic. Despite all her best efforts, she just seems to keep falling flat on her face. Maybe other albums failed harder, but nothing failed louder. In fact, you can make the case that the now ubiquitous pop fandom term flop era was coined as a direct result of this album. Witness is the original flop era. And it only feels right that that honor should go to such a legendary flop. To put it mildly, this is not the first Witness retrospective that's ever been written, and it won't be the last. It's gained a certain car crash mythos that's only grown with time, because it's not just a bad album. It's not even just a spectacular fall from grace from one of the best-selling artists alive. It's also a heartbreaking tragedy, because this was Katie's attempt to stand for good in the world. Describe your album witness in one word. Liberated. This was Katie trying to be taken seriously, to change her image into something both positive and deep, and it was rejected as hard as anything can be rejected. I wouldn't usually cover something this recent or this overexposed, but I have always been fascinated by witness. The moment Katie started making the worst and most unloved music of her career is the day I started being interested in Katie as a person. Can I get a witness? You so let us now bear witness to a pop star famed for her shallowness, trying to blossom into a mature, liberated, socially conscious artiste, and only looking faker and more limited than ever. Katy Perry gets woke and goes broke. This is Train Records. <laughs> Can you see me? I mean, I know you can see me, but can you really see me? My name is Katherine Hudson. I'm vulnerable and strong. I'm a woman, an artist. I'm liberated, goofy, and I'm not always right. I'm Katy Perry, and I'm not just one thing. Can I get a witness? I promised myself that I wasn't going to use the word cringe during this episode. So let's just take that dating profile she just read at us and let's see what it told us. Can you really see me? It said that even though Katy Perry is among the most overexposed singers on the planet, we hadn't seen the real Katy, or we hadn't seen more than one side of her. This is undeniably true. In hindsight, some observers said that we didn't need to, that Katy Perry's first mistake was trying to offer new sides of herself to begin with, that no one wanted or needed that from her. I do not agree. I think on some level, Katy Perry desperately needed to change. See, I've been reviewing pop music a long time, and 
In doing so, I have said something to piss off every major fan base in the universe. I have had my mentions swarmed and my day ruined by the BTS Army, the Rihanna Navy, the Little Monsters, the Swifties, the Beehive, the Beliebers, the Barbs, oh god the Barbs, the Directioners, the Levatics, the Selenators, the Arianators, most recently the Camillizers, and so on. Katy Perry stands are called the Katy Cats. And they have never bothered me once. I kind of suspect they never existed. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's at least a few that are probably writing angry comments right now. But in hindsight, the Katy Perry phenomenon was clearly more fragile than it looked. For a while now, I've been workshopping this theory that there are two kinds of pop stars. First, there are the ones who are so compelling, so infused with that star quality and creativity, that they'll always have that loyal core fan base to sustain them, waiting for the next record. And then there are the superstars who will be superstars for as long as the music is good. And if the bots stop coming for even a second, they're gone. This is what separates a Janet Jackson from a Paul Abdul, an Eminem from a Marilyn Manson. The Weeknd is probably the first kind, Bruno Mars is probably the second. I admit it's not a perfect theory. For example, if, like Bruno, you just continually keep putting up bangers, you can maybe move from the second category to the first, but Katy Perry was definitely not there, and I think she knew that. I don't know when I started to sense that Katy Perry was unhappy being Katy Perry. I distinctly remember a moment in 2012 when I saw her perform Firework at some charity event with an autistic child. It was very inspiring, and you could tell this meant a lot to her. It's always stuck with me, because Katy Perry was not otherwise seen as a very inspiring artist. Critics had learned to treat pop music seriously by that point, but they loved highbrow Gaga, or heartfelt Taylor, not lowbrow plastic Katy Perry, who presented herself as this willfully tasteless edge lord, edge lady, who went around being one of the guys, wearing low-cut outfits, making gay jokes, shooting whipped cream from her boobs, shilling for the army. I was just a budding young content creator in 2010, and Katy Perry was a major guilty pleasure of mine. Whenever I liked one of her songs, I'd be all embarrassed and apologize for it. Like, imagine that. Imagine apologizing for liking Teenage Dream, now considered one of the best songs of the decade. But that's how it was. Her reputation was just not very good. Even her uplifting songs seemed pretty hollow. Gaga made her flamboyance feel substantial, but Katie just seemed like she had no cake under the frosting. So I see Katie beaming with pride for inspiring that little girl, and I just wonder what else she had in her career that was gonna make her feel like that. Equal rights for men, women. She's never gone so far as to say that she regrets it all, but by 2016, she was clearly in a very different headspace. She had once disavowed the word feminist, but now she embraced it. She got politically active and started campaigning really hard for Hillary Clinton. She was deeply invested in helping elect our first female president. As you may recall, that did not happen. By all accounts, Katie did not take it well. And as America entered a serious flop era of its own, Katy Perry decided that it was time that her music got serious. There is, of course, one other major change in Katie's career that we have to mention. In 2014, Dr. Luke, the producer behind all of Katie's hits, was accused of rape. Katie has very carefully said very little about it publicly, and I will not speculate what she thinks privately. The point is she clearly couldn't work with him now, especially not while trying to brand herself publicly as a progressive feminist. Katie's change in image was going to have to be accompanied by a change in sound. In February of 2017, just a month after Trump's inauguration, Katy Perry came out with her new song. This was the beginning of an era that Katy had a name for, a name that would haunt this record as the album rollout continued. I'm so proud of it. I think it's definitely a new era for me. I call it um, an era of purposeful pop. Purposeful think, pop. Um, you know, mm -hmm. So, let us examine what purpose there was to our new purposeful Katie. This is Witness's first and most successful single, Chain to the Rhythm. 
for it, Katie jettisoned Dr. Luke and replaced him with Luke's mentor, Max Martin, and songwriter extraordinaire Sia. And you can definitely hear Sia's fingerprints all over this. For someone best known for bright, shiny bubblegum, Katie took a shocking direction and wrote about how mindless dance music is blinding and numbing us all to the harsh realities of the world. This from the same woman who wrote You're So Gay. Whew, we're going there. Like Katy Perry was the queen of party music. Turn it up, it's a favorite song. Dance, dance, dance to the distortion. By making a dance song where the dance is explicitly tied to willful blindness and stupidity, she can only be pointing the finger right at herself. Not everyone knew what to do with this sudden shift. I've checked the old blogs and people are more positive than you remember, but they're all very divided on this song. Me personally, I put Chain to the Rhythm on my best list that year and I stand by it. For one, I just like Sia's songwriting. You can tell this was arranged and structured by her and she's good at it, but also it really speaks to a moment in time. The election was traumatic in a lot of ways and I think this really does capture a lot of that shattering disappointment. When the video came out, it was even more striking, depicting some kind of theme park of the future, complete with blunt, satirical references to the various ills of society, war, climate change, the housing bubble, while Katie and her goofy costume peers vacuously missed the danger. The style of the video was influenced by various sci-fi universes, but everyone seemed to zero in on one influence in particular the Hunger Games. Specifically, the opulent, over-designed fashion of the decadent capital. Katie has never named those movies explicitly as an influence, but it seems pretty likely, considering her famous Super Bowl performance also seemed very Hunger Games-y, including performing with an actual Hunger Games cast member. But there, it didn't really make sense. You can't dress up as Katniss Everdeen, the dystopian rebel leader, and then party with Left Shark. Now, it would make way more sense to play a Katniss-type figure during this era, the same way that a hot young newcomer named Halsey was doing around that time. But that's not the way she went. So, who is she instead? Not a mere capital citizen, surely. Katy Perry is the spectacle, not the spectator. So then who? May the odds be ever in your favor. Effie Trinket, played by Elizabeth Banks in the movies, is one of the hosts of the Hunger Games. She runs the live draws for the human sacrifices, and she acts as Katniss's image consultant and media coach. In the books and the first movie, she's portrayed as a chattering ditz who is willfully oblivious to the horror she participates in. However, in the movie sequels, she starts to register the injustice of the system, and eventually it completely breaks her. The last we see of her, she has joined the Rebels. Now, I have no evidence that Katy Perry was inspired by this or has even seen these movies. She's never said anything. Nevertheless, I am unshakably certain that she saw herself in this character specifically and it inspired this video. One, it expresses the shame Katy feels as a walking, breathing avatar of shallowness, keeping the masses happy and stupid while leading the young and innocent into a brutal and deadly system. Wonder how she feels about this now, ahem. And two, it suggests a redemption arc. It shows that even a willfully ignorant agent of the corrupt state can wake up and become a hero. Which is great. It's all well and good. But if that is what Katie was thinking, there's another element to Effie's arc that should have given her pause. As a rebel, separated from her cosmetics and luxuries, Effie Trinket looks absolutely miserable. Turn it up, turn it on. Chain to the Rhythm is a feel-bad song. It's a pop song about how pop songs are evil. It is almost designed to fail. I find it compelling mostly as a look into Katy Perry's tortured psyche, but I don't expect anyone to be as fascinated with one rich white woman's self-loathing as I am. Like, maybe this could have worked as a stealth satire, but there's zero stealth to this. It's sledgehammer blunt and utterly despairing. There's just no mistaking what it means. Katie's fans certainly figured out what it meant, and many of them were justifiably insulted. 
So who's we, Katie? Like, it's one thing if Katie doesn't feel good personally about her success, but saying we're all stupid for listening to her? Okay, screw you too. Listening to Katy Perry does not mean you were unaware of the issues of the world. For a lot of people, Katy Perry was a relief from those problems. And even if you wanted Katy Perry to get deeper, is this the direction you really wanted her to go? Is this what people were crying out for? A song about the vacuousness of pop culture? Katy Perry was at the Women's March, surrounded by furious people ready to fight the power. How could she have missed that no one there wanted to wallow? They certainly didn't want to talk about how stupid pop culture brought us to this point. It's just pop music. Who fucking cares? We have actual issues to worry about. Not everything's about you, Katy Perry. And that's to say nothing about the verse from Skip Marley, who had an extremely strange 2017 soundtracking white celebrities' journey into wokeness. I still like this song. I think it's strong. I think it's catchy. It's certainly unique. But it was never going to be a hit. In her first stab at purposeful pop, Katy Perry completely misjudged the moment. Chain to the Rhythm did mediocre numbers by Katy's standards. But Katy was committed, and she made sure everyone knew. Sexualizing myself was like this attention-grabbing thing. It went into my 20s and it went into my career, just like over-sexualizing and not like... She began wearing less revealing outfits, got a short blonde haircut that no one seemed to like, gave a lot of interviews about her new outlook. In May, she dropped the next single. So let us hear the next step in the evolution of Katie and her progressive, purposeful pop. The next song was called Bon Appetit, a sex song based around food metaphors. Appetite for seduction, fresh out the oven, melting your mouth kind of loving. I mean, that's a purpose, I guess. Okay, maybe Bon Appetit was always the plan. I mean, it probably was. Katy Perry can't just stop being Katy Perry after all. But to me, it looked a lot like a panic move. A desperate step backwards to pull back everyone turned off by the first single. I'm sure she had to be worried when she'd do interviews about her new left-wing agenda and then get asked, but where's our summer jam, Katie? Don't worry, you're gonna, you're gonna have some of that good old Katy Perry fluffy stuff that you love so much. So instead, we have something more commercial, more Katie-like plus a rap verse from Migos who were white hot at the time. This will surely turn things around. I'm on the menu. Yeah, it didn't do that. Bon Appetit bricked immediately and it deserved to. Chain to the Rhythm was a decent execution of a questionable concept. Bon Appetit is just a disaster from the get-go. The song's a mess, there's no hook, and a song this explicit is really not in Katie's wheelhouse. I think she was trying to keep it light with the food innuendos, but this is still probably the dirtiest song she's ever released, and it's directly at odds with her wink-wink, tee-hee brand of sexuality. Chain to the Rhythm was considered an underperformer by only getting up to number four, but Bon Appetit couldn't even break the top 50 and was gone in a month, which is only fair. Trying to be that sexual while making her trademark tacky videos, boy, it does not work. It's too gross to be fun and it's way too stupid to be erotic. Unless you're Army Hammer, there's nothing hot about Katy Perry dressing up like a chicken cutlet and jumping into a pot of vegetables. I don't want to fuck a roast turkey, Katy. But of course, this unappetizing video is not the visual people remember. Once again, Katy Perry. What people remember of Bon Appetit Perhaps the defining moment of the Witness era was from May 20th, when she got booked on SNL. Boy, seems all right so far. Let's bring out Migos. I swear to God, I just watched Katy Perry age 15 years right in front of me. Who choreographed this? My mom? And we'll have our own dance. Every Simpson dance now. Bum, 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 bum. I've watched this moment over and over again. I've never seen anything like it. Ashley Simpson had a better night on SNL than this. Now, if you read the comments on YouTube, you will see people blaming Migos. 
The story is that Katie had a big drag queen performance planned that night, but Migos refused to share the stage with them, forcing Katie to improvise the thing you're seeing. To be clear, the story appears to be false. The original article it came from didn't name its sources, and then it was deleted for unknown reasons. Everyone, including the drag queens, have denied it. But it sure seems plausible, right? I bought it completely at first. For one, it plays into our stereotypes of homophobic rappers, which Migos has gotten in trouble for before. But also, it's an explanation? Any explanation for an otherwise inexplicable performance? Katy Perry's entire existence reeks of effort. She often tries too hard, but she never half-asses it. She always goes big. Like, she's a seasoned vet at this point. Even if she did have to ad-lib, how was that what she came up with? My god, was she this lame the entire time? In June, the album dropped. It looked like this, which... How could a Katy Perry album with this artwork have failed? Now, I've heard this 90s prog metal album cover might be a reference to The Neon Demon, an elevated horror movie about an aspiring model. It has a similar color palette, similarly dim view of fame and glamour. I won't spoil it, but there is some eye and mouth imagery in there. Uh, if that's what this is a reference to, uh, you realize you're Katy Perry, right? I see this cover and I think Katy has some serious Gaga envy. Gaga could get away with a Neon Demon reference. Katie was already stretching it with the Hunger Games. Stick to Candyland. Actually, the promotion was just baffling all around. Today's friend is... Katy Perry! <laughs> For Bon Appetit, she literally served her head on a plate? Uh, the release itself was accompanied by a weird stunt where Katie moved into a Big Brother-type house and live streamed for four straight days. She cried during a public therapy session, which I'm not sure is a great way to do therapy. She hung out with various celebrities and activists and talked about politics. I've made several mistakes, even in like the this is how we do video about how I wore my hair, but I can educate, my, educate myself and that's what I'm trying to do along the way. And even I don't know what goal this was supposed to accomplish, but I don't think it succeeded. I'm not going to go too deep into the album itself because, quite frankly, no one cares. Katy Perry is a singles artist, always had been. Her LPs are not worth much, which may be why she never really had that depth of fan base. So most Katy albums are bad, but even by her standards, Witness is pretty damn bad. The non-singles are about split into three categories. Katy's despair, Katy's liberation slash empowerment, and songs about a dysfunctional relationship and or breakup, which may explain some of Katie's angst during this time. All of them pretty much suck. The hooks are weak, the production is thin, Katie's lyrics are as clunky as ever. And look, 2017 was gonna be hard for Katie regardless because that now looks like a pretty serious changeover year in pop. You look at the big hit makers of that one or two years, Ed Sheeran, Halsey, B.B. Rexa, The Chainsmokers, Migos, Kendrick Lamar, Zayn, Alessia Cara, Shawn Mendes, 21 Pilots, not a whole lot of bright candy colors in there. These are not all lesser stars than Katie in her prime, but they all certainly shine less intensely. They're slow burn, minor key artists where Katy Perry's brand of mega turbo pop does not fit at all. Rather than go with her old style or the new style, she just kind of splits the difference and winds up sounding like nothing. Many producers worked on this record with very little to show for it. Seems like no one really had a strong sonic vision for the purposeful pop era. The branding of Witness as a message album is very strange because it's much more of a breakup album. But as for politics, the most explicit message is Bigger Than Me, which she wrote after the election. And it's about how, even though Katie is heartbroken, she's part of something much bigger that genuinely matters. It's me. If that message strikes you as frustratingly vague, well, that's all you get. Chain to the Rhythm, for all its navel-gazing faults, still strikes me as a gutsy move, and she does not have the nerve to be that critical again. It doesn't help that she comes from a fundamentalist family, and 
that from what I can tell, she's reluctant to make their strained relationship any worse. So her big message era turned out to be pretty underwhelming. I'm like, I will have a conversation with you because we need to have conversations with both sides to be united. In real life, she mostly said a lot of squishy, centrist things about listening to the other side and understanding each other, and I'm sorry, that shit does not play. Katie is a big pop star. She just wants to be loved by everyone, and in 2017, that just wasn't possible. On August 24th, two months after the album dropped, Katy Perry dropped the video for her third single, Swish Swish, which on its own just astonished me. How was there a third video? How? The album had already clearly tanked by that point. This is yet another way in which Katie's seen behind the times. She seems like she hasn't adapted to the streaming era, and was unprepared for a time when only the very most successful records get a third single, or even a single after the album drops. No one's getting five number ones off one record ever again. But anyway, Swish Swish. Katy Perry's diss track. Okay, the backstory, in case you somehow don't know. Katy Perry fell out with fellow pop star Taylor Swift for boring showbiz reasons not worth recounting here. But Taylor wrote a song about it that became a number one hit. Now, there are Taylor songs that I don't like, but I get why people do. I have never understood the appeal of Bad Blood. It's a terrible song, with a terrible overrated video, and I can only attribute its success to people just enjoying public drama. So maybe Katy Perry can also ride your tawdry interest in celebrity feuds back onto the charts. Swish Swish may be the worst video of the decade. I was already predisposed to hate it because it was constantly shitting up my YouTube recommendations with that thumbnail of Katie making what I can only call YouTube thumbnail face, but it's awful. Katie gave up trying to look tough and instead went for comedy and depicted herself as a beleaguered underdog in what is basically a live action space jam. It completely steps on the tone of the song and comedy has never been Katie's strong point. <laughs> the fat one ate a basketball. There are a bunch of dated memes. <laughs> a bunch of celebrity cameos in an attempt to match Taylor's. But Taylor pulled in the likes of Selena Gomez, Haley Williams, and Zendaya, while Katie had the star power of Molly Shannon, the supporting cast of Glow, Gronk, probably here to sell you some insurance. Can't imagine a lot of Katy Perry fans lighting up for Gronk. The one highlight is a solid verse from Nicki Minaj in one of her famous green screen appearances. Not that it comes close to saving the song itself, which is also very bad. It's a shame because Swish Swish is one of the few Witness tracks with a solid beat, but oh, Katie's attempts at shade. Wow, shots fired directly into her own foot. What the fuck does a tiger have to do with shellfish? Like sheep, I get. Sheep is an insult. But shellfish? Any shellfish I wouldn't fuck with at all. Game is tired. You should retire. Your fat is cute as an old coupon expired. Huh? I, I don't even have a joke. Just just what? Can you imagine like Taylor just crying in her bedroom? Like, I can't believe she called me cute as an expired coupon! Turns out, it didn't really matter what Katie threw at her, because Taylor destroyed her anyway. The day that Katy Perry dropped this awful video, the day, the very day, Taylor Swift absolutely wrecked her shit by dropping this little bomb. I check it once, then I check it twice, oh, oh look 
What you made me do. On August 24th, 2017, Taylor released Look What You Made Me Do, sweeping away the old Taylor once and for all, overshadowing every last mention of Swish Swish, and worst of all, not mentioning Katie once, having moved on to feuds with people that actually mattered. The fact that Taylor's song was even worse and the beginning of an extremely rough three year period for her, that's all completely besides the point. The point is that no one was talking about Katie anymore. But even if Katie had won the feud, would that have been a good thing? Wasn't this about being purposeful pop? Katie tried to put a positive spin on it by calling the song anti-bullying. Yeah, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining, Katie. The only appeal of the song is watching a mega diva being a catty bitch, and you couldn't even do that right. So how did Katie not come out of this with any good singles? The obvious conclusion was that Katie needed Dr. Luke. No one wants to say that, considering what he's accused of, but people have said it. I am not gonna say that, though. In fact, I have a counter-argument. Maybe Witness didn't kill Katie's career. Maybe Prism killed Katie's career. Prism was the album right before, and it did have a bunch of hits, but come on, anything Katie released after Teenage Dream would have been huge. There's a phenomenon that I call the delayed flop, where something becomes successful just through hype or momentum, but it turns out no one really likes it, and you end up paying for it on the next installment. I mean, let's look at Prism. Its biggest hit was Roar, Closest thing to it from the previous album was Firework, which was obviously better than Roar. My favorite Prism single was Birthday. California Girls was obviously better than Birthday. The other number one hit from Prism was Dark Horse. Uh, I didn't love E.T., but E.T.'s obviously better than Dark Horse, now often called one of the worst number ones of the decade. And you barely hear any of those songs anymore. Witness was probably always gonna suck, but Prism had already put Katie in a losing position, even if it wasn't clear at the time. In December, the final video from the album was released, which... What? How? At this point, this isn't even promoting the song or the album, it's just a vanity project. And boy is it ever. Like, it's a shame no one saw this or cared by that point, because this video will tell you pretty much everything you need to know about how Katy Perry sees herself. She's a Marie Antoinette who fantasizes about being Joan of Arc. Wow, that's horribly depressing. Like, that's a level of self-hatred that even I can't relate to. Like, I don't think that's what she was going for. I think it's supposed to be empowering, but it's not because we already know she's not going to become the Joan of Arc, and also because the song is just absolutely terrible. The hook is atrocious. Lyrically, it's about how she can be soft and fierce. Yeah, she's a girl boss, you might say. Mm -hmm. Since 2017, so-called girl boss feminism has become controversial for reasons that I'm not going to parse out here, except to say that I thought the whole point of this era is that she shouldn't have to be expected to be pretty all the goddamn time. A big beautiful brain with a pretty face, yeah. Still, you know, it was an attempt to be uplifting and inspiring, which would have made it a much better message to lead the album with if, you know, the song didn't suck so much. Despite this being a thoroughly uncohesive record, Katie managed to write a pretty solid album closer called Pendulum. For some reason, it's not the album closer. She made it the song before the closer, which... Ah, <sighs> Katie... But if there is a deep cut on Witness worth preserving, it's probably this one. Pendulum is a song about how even when things are dark, you can ride it out and things will eventually swing back, which is kind of the hopeful message that Katie herself needed. I don't think she expected Witness to be the dark times she would have to swing back from, and tragically, I'm not sure the pendulum is ever going to swing back for her. But on the other hand, maybe it already has. Witness was the tipping point for Katy Perry. It wasn't just a bad album. It convinced everyone that Katy Perry was a bad artist and always had been. She had just been too obnoxious for too long, she was banished forever, and she's never come close to restoring herself to the top of the charts. But despite that, it seems like there's a lot more affection for her now than there was at her peak. Part of that is just nostalgia, and we can now admit that she had some very good songs. But also, if Witness was supposed to humanize Katy Perry, turn her from a plastic doll into something real, in its strange way, it kind of succeeded. 
Every good diva or icon needs some kind of dark period in her narrative, right? Something to make her story resonate. Witness is unquestionably a failure, as art, as a commercial product, as a social statement, everything. But what happens without Witness? What happens if Katy Perry just makes another Katy Perry record? Probably wouldn't have been great either. She's a firework. Fireworks don't last very long. Even most of the biggest stars don't make hits forever. Most likely she would have just quietly petered out and gone away, like Fergie or Pitbull. It was hard to care about Katy Perry before this, but falling on her face made Katy Perry into a figure of real pathos. She became someone you could feel bad for, embarrassed for, and maybe subsequently root for. Katy's in Vegas now, and her set list still has Chained to the Rhythm and Bon Appetit and Swish Swish, so unlikely as it seems, maybe she does owe Witness something. And in fact, maybe because of it, that comeback has a chance. I mean, she's on train records because, yeah, her career is probably over. But just because it's over doesn't mean it's really over. Good luck, Katie. Cause we're all chained to the rhythm. Thanks for watching. And while I have your attention, may I speak to you about Curiosity Stream. You know David Byrne, legendary frontman of all-time great new wave band Talking Heads? Well, it turns out he's also a gigantic fan of Color Guard. And in 2015, he staged an amazing giant Color Guard event with Nelly Furtado and St. Vincent, and you can watch the entire thing in the behind-the-scenes concert documentary Contemporary Color, which you can find on Curiosity Stream. Go to curiositystream.com slash Todd in the Shadows, and you will get an entire year for just $14.79. That's nothing. Not only is that a 26% discount on the regular price, you will also get free access to Nebula, a streaming video platform built for and by independent creators like H Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, and myself. So you will get all the high budget premium content you get on CuriosityStream, plus all the independent video creators on Nebula. Once you use the code and get CuriosityStream, you'll get a welcome email from Nebula giving you access, and you'll have access to both services. So sign up now, click the link in the description, and enjoy. Thank you for listening, and good night.